Let's start with Maggie. Sure. Uh, Maggie is with uh, Orsted North America. Orsted is a renewable energy um, a global operation. Why don't you just quickly tell people what Orsted is and does? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Michael. And thank you so much for having me here and having Orsted uh, represented at this really impressive uh, event today. I've really enjoyed um, all of this morning's uh, discussions. Um, so I, I kind of like to say Orsted is the largest energy company you've never heard of. Um, we are a global green energy major, um, but we actually used to be an oil and gas major uh, for many decades. And then about 15 years ago, the company decided to make a really dramatic transition into the green energy space. Um, today, again, we are, we are one of the leaders in that space. Uh, we do um, uh, sort of across uh, pan technologies, wind, solar, storage, an increasingly aggressive green hydrogen program, but our claim to fame has really been offshore wind. Uh, we pioneered the technology back in Denmark about 15 years ago. Uh, now we have about uh, eight gigawatts operational across the globe, Asia Pacific, Europe, the UK, and here in the US. Um, in the US market, we've got about five gigawatts of offshore wind uh, under contract, which is the market leading uh, position. And so we're thrilled about that. And I'll just flag a couple of um, sort of underlying principles that we have brought with us as we've um, entered into the US market, particularly around our offshore wind business, um, which is first looking at building out the domestic supply chain. Um, this, you know, the US market for offshore wind is, is relatively young compared to the rest of, well, particularly compared to Europe. Um, and this has created a huge opportunity for us to attract some of our suppliers to come and build facilities and sort of onshore those facilities here in the US, um, as well as to tap into some of the existing uh, skill sets that we have um, in the US, particularly when we look at the maritime sector, there's huge opportunity there to bring those folks into the offshore wind business. And so we've really strived to uh, build out that domestic supply chain even before, frankly, we've commissioned any commercial projects. So, um, and I'll just, I'll just yeah. quickly mention, because Brad's sitting right next to me, the other thing is that we have, we've really leaned into our work with organized labor. Um, and that was, I think, really um, cemented earlier this year. We signed what's called the National Offshore Wind Agreement to commit to uh, having all of the offshore construction work being done on our projects done with organized labor. Terrific. So, um, yeah, that's worth an applause. You may applaud. Um, an obvious question for you would be, uh, how do the climate provisions in the uh, IRA uh, affect uh, your work? It's, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, it can't, it can't be overstated. I think, um, you know, simply put, as a company that does have assets globally and we're playing in a lot of different markets, um, we have choices to make when it comes to where we're going to uh, deploy our capital. And having uh, sort of the long-term certainty and the commitment that comes from policy like the Inflation Reduction Act makes it a lot easier for a company like Orsted to double down on our investments in the United States. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you. Brad Markell. Brad is the uh, executive director of the AFL-CIO Industrial Union Council, now the IUC is the manufacturing arm of the AFL-CIO with 12 unions representing about a million workers. Hi, Brad. Um, <clears throat> so you are also uh, um, sort of the, make sure I'm looking at the right place, the um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> involved in a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, with labor's engagement with the administration in terms of its manufacturing agenda. So what, does that mean? What, what, what do you see? Well, uh, again, uh, thanks to Roosevelt. Wonderful thing and great to be sitting here with Orsted, who has become a real partner for labor and has given an example to all the other corporations out there about how they might approach this question. Um, I think the first thing to say, it's a, a mainly unreconstructed UAW guy for back in the day, yeah. it's good to see industrial policy having its moment. The manufacturing unions we're pushing hard on industrial policy going back to the 1980s. Um, so I think it's a moment for everybody here, right? We've all achieved this together. The administration laid out a pretty clear vision and I, I think it's important to think, think of the infrastructure law chips in IRA as this kind of arc of cradle to grave for uh, technologies and, and, and then 
you know, if you look at the bill, the, the DOE and a demonstration project, you'll find the IRA for the stuff that's market ready. So we've got this, this great arc. Um, but that's a piece of it, right? To have an industrial policy, you need to provide a direction. And for a long time in the United States, that was win the Cold War or the subsidiary project of winning the Cold War, get to the moon. Uh, now it is clearly climate change and the complete remaking of our economy uh, to deal with climate change. And if you look early, the administration set the tone in a number of ways, not just this, right? There was the climate executive order, which used the word unions more than it used the word climate. So that's you know, just sort of <laughs> helped us out a little bit there. Um, you know, the, the supply chain stuff. The, I think that the critique of the antitrust that the administration has put forward is extremely important on the functioning of markets. And then of course, the, the NDC uh, for the Paris Agreement and so on. But still a lot to do, right? Somehow we got all the way through this and deal, didn't deal with shipbuilding. It's taking up increasing amounts of our time. Uh, I think we're going to, from our point of view, we're going to have to deal with border adjustments. We have to understand what's happening with currency and how that affects uh, U.S. competitiveness and with the, with the Fed right, you know, raising rates, which uh, from at least my personal point of view, enough already. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and the IRA rules. We've got to get those rules out yeah, so can, companies can know what they're spending. Yeah, can you talk in a little bit more detail about these IRA rules that, and the um, perspective on them? So Treasury's got to issue rules or guidance, we hope, uh, quickly so that the, the Davis-Bacon provisions and the domestic content provisions can all be put into place. Those are important gains for American workers, and they got to be reflected in the rules so that, you know, as people are claiming these tax credits, they're bound by that. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing, and this is a bigger picture piece, and I don't think our political system has come to grips uh, with, with the deeply anti-union attitudes that are baked into American management culture. In manufacturing, where I come from, it's just, it's like impossible, right? They'll move, they'll, they'll, they'll fire people, and you know the administration has done what it can, in terms of provide you know the Richard L. Trumka Pro Act, right? Uh, but that didn't pass. We didn't get anything in reconciliation on Pro Act fines. We've got to find a way to crack this question open in a major way. Tripartite convenings, we think, are a way to do that, just to get everybody in a room and hash it out. Uh, but somehow. If we're going to escape inequality, and I will note that inequality is always part of the recipe for the rise of authoritarianism. There's, right, that's, that's just part of what's happening here, right? We're going to have to deal with corporate power, and that means confronting corporate anti-union attitudes in a way that we haven't before, given the tools we have, right? We're, we don't have labor law reform, so we have to do something different. Tripartite discussions might be a way to start that. Brad, thank you. Todd Tucker is the Director of Industrial Policy and Trade at the Roosevelt Institute. Hi, Todd. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, well, let's, uh, let's talk about labor unions and their role in industrial policy. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's really interesting about this moment, you know, sort of as, as a history nerd to kind of zoom out a little bit, is that if you look at sort of the, the Industrial Revolution the first time around, you know, the, the economic changes happened first, and then there was the sort of bloody class war later to try to sort of impose unions and democratic governance structures on the, uh, on the industries that had sort of gone before. And I think what's unique about this moment is that we have the time, to, we, we're, we're building a lot of these industries from scratch. Mm -hmm. And so we have the time, we have the opportunity in the window to, from the very beginning, incorporate democratic unions uh, into the structure of, of these new industries. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I think that that would be uh, smart politics um, in addition to just being a good thing to do generally. Um, you know, a lot of the political science research shows that, um, you know, part of the reason we have not made major change uh, on, on climate has been that the fossil fuel industry uh, can block, uh, can block progress from happening. Um, what we need is a new set of veto points in the system uh, in, in green, green energy industry, green energy labor, uh, to, begin to, uh, to begin to push for this economic transformation. And we know that if you don't, uh, you know, Adam Dean from GW is here and he has a really important new book that looks at how economic transformations work when you don't include labor. Uh, and it's pretty brutal. Uh, he, he goes through some, uh, some of the economic transformations in Latin America and elsewhere 
where labor repression was the way that you made the economic transformation happen. And I think it's critical that we not do that this time. Instead, we go in the, in the, in the total opposite direction. Uh, and I think that some of the stuff that Brad uh, mentioned on sort of Buy American and, and domestic content are one way to ensure that as we're making the transition that we're embedding some of those benefits in communities uh, across the United States. And, and I think another really important precedent for the US context as someone from the Roosevelt Institute, I'm contractually obliged to make a plug for FDR. Um, but um, you know, I think that looking back at the, at the New Deal, I mean, the New Deal industrial policy and institutions like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation were really the, one of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious example of, of a robust industrial policy in US history. And one of the things that was so important uh, about that effort was an examination of that no industry is in isolation. There's connections across the economy and smart industrial policy institutions at the government level can help leverage those, leverage those interconnections. And I think to, to Mary Kay Henry's point uh, from earlier uh, just now, uh, you know, thinking about the interconnections between the green energy transformation uh, on the capital and productivity side and the national security side, how that connects then with the care industry on the employment side and making sure that those jobs are good jobs and that these, these sectors of the economy are supporting each other as we do the transition, I think is going to be critical. And, and how is the Biden administration, do, are, are there things they could be doing that they're not yet, I mean, they're doing a lot, but are there things they could be doing that they're not yet doing? I think four big pieces of legislation uh, yeah. in, in, your, in the first two years. Uh, I think that that, <laughs> that stacks up pretty well That's against the historical record yeah. uh, of recent decades where it yeah. seemed to be like maybe one piece of legislation. So I'll take four over one, I, you know, yeah. I'm a numbers guy on some level, so like yeah. I'll take the four over one. Uh, no, I, I think that they're I think that they're doing you know given the political constraints, uh, it's it's very impressive what they've been able to do. Uh, you know, I think that a few you know we've only planned this event over the last few weeks essentially because a, a month and a half ago, two months ago, it didn't seem like there would have been necessarily as much to celebrate. Um, so uh, so I think that you know they they've taken of the window that they've had, they've they've gone a long way with it. But we definitely need to get back to the rest of the agenda, which is the PRO Act, which is the care economy, right? It's the, these other things that need to come back, uh, hopefully, after uh, 2022. Uh, I'll, I'll, add, I'll add one thing to the list as the, as the greedy company that, yep. that always wants more. No, but, uh, it, super impressive list, and, but, but I think, Todd, to your point that these things are all very interconnected. One thing John Podesta spoke to this morning was the importance of permitting reform. And I think we've been pleasantly surprised that it's gotten the amount of attention and bipartisan attention that it has in the last um, few months. But I think as a, as a clean energy developer, particularly that's building a lot of projects in federal waters, getting that permitting process right and you know, making sure that it, you know, it absolutely is, is providing all the environmental protections that it needs to, but can accelerate this clean energy moment that we have to meet uh, and, and converge with the benefits of the IRA. I think getting that right is, is, a, is a big hurdle, but one that everyone in this room would be wise to like pull up a seat and let's figure out a, uh, the way to get there. I will just put a plunk on permitting reform for the labor movement. It's desperate. We're not going to hit our climate goals without permitting reform, full stop. I want to conclude by asking all three of you to speak briefly on, on this question, which relates to something that Brad raised and which I write about in my book, and it's a really important thing. What we're trying to do here in a lot of ways is not just uh, uh, right policy. We're trying to change presumptions that have been held by the American people or by American elites for 40 years. Uh, how far down that road are we? Uh, just Todd, then Maggie, then Brad. I mean, I think that you know part part of why we did this event today is because we do sort of see that there is some changes in the defaults, right? Uh, I think that if you look at sort of the economic style of reasoning that's kind of dominated a lot of economic policymaking in recent decades, the attitude was that you know it doesn't matter where the where the wind turbines are made as long as they're cheap, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot there's a change, at, somewhat in the economics profession, but also outside of the economics profession, to really think more broadly about the political economy. Uh, not just yes. narrow sort of neoclassical economics. Um, and I think that we are sort of seeing that shift. Uh, and I think with a number of different Biden administration policies, you're seeing sort of an, an attention to not just doing good economic policy, but also doing it while you're bringing your constituency along so that someone's there to defend you <laughs> when you get attacked from the other side. So I think that that's been a, 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 an impressive part of their 
incorporating politics into uh, economic policy making. What, what Todd mentioned is why I didn't get a PhD in economics 35 <laughs> years ago. Uh, and it, it's really important, like 25 or a thousand $25 haircuts are not the same in the economy as one $25,000 Chevy, right? They're, those, those are two different things. And there is a difference between, without mentioning who said this, between computer chips and potato chips. And I think we've seen that now. So th it's a happy turn. The question is, can we really set the hook, especially with the business community, in ways that it doesn't flip back? Yeah, I'll just picking up on the supply chain analogy. I mean, I think that is that is a huge um, opportunity that we have. And as I mentioned before, I mean, Orsted is really looking at domesticating a supply chain for renewable energy, but specifically for offshore wind as a huge opportunity not only for our bottom line, because I think we really do see huge savings in um, the logistical costs that go into shipping these products around the world. So let's, you know, let's build it these huge pieces of equipment for these projects near where we're going to be deploying them. But also it goes a long way to helping our sustainability goals of driving carbon emissions out of our supply chain. So there's a lot of good reasons that we're doing it, but having the government policy that is rewarding and encouraging that behavior. I mean, that just, um, you know, that I'd like to say we're already a company doing that, but then once you kind of have that um, reward for it, it um, really, I think, solidifies the good behavior and attracts more players to replicate that good behavior. So overall positive thing. I have two audience questions. I, I don't think all three of you need necessarily to answer both of these, but whoever wants to step in. Uh, <clears throat> one of the examples of successful industrial policy in the United States resulted in the rise of the digital economy and big tech companies, but among the many concerns related to big tech is the exploitation of workers through misclassification, etc. How to make sure that this new industrial policy doesn't repeat these mistakes? Anybody? I mean, you know, I think, I think that the, the, the question really points to an important one that was raised earlier in the day, which is that uh, there's no country that pursues no industrial policy. And there's no time period where there's no industrial policy happening. It's always happening. It's really just for whose benefit. Uh, and I think if you look at some of the, the, the structure of tech regulation over the last few decades, it's certainly encouraged the emergence of a certain type of extractive business model. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, part of how you don't do that, how part of how you do the opposite is incorporate things like prevailing wage standards, domestic content, environmental standards, uh, into your into your public procurement, into the incentives. You know, I think one of the really interesting things about the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is that it takes it uses a form that's very familiar in U.S. politics of tax credits, but then it uses them in a way that's more like procurement or subsidies or some other type of scheme. And that in order to qualify for it, you've got to be social facing mm -hmm. uh, as a company, as an investor, in, in terms of your labor, your environment your domestic supply chain. So I think that that's, that's also sort of an interesting shift that we're seeing. There's a reason this is going to be such a fight, which is our industrial policy in the past 40 or 50 years, and especially maybe the past 30 on the second point I'll make, is that one, the finance sector is running the show. Two, our basic industrial policy is that all the states try to screw all the other states with tax giveaways. That's it. And so we've got to change. Uh, let me ask the second and final question. Uh, what is the risk to our investments in clean energy manufacturing if we're not prepared to use trade actions like tariffs to level the playing field when other countries are dumping, dumping subsidi subsidized goods often made in worse polluting factories with lower or non-existent labor standards? Ooh, that feels like a Brad question. <laughs> say, I, I didn't catch the, what the, the end of it. The, uh, say, the, say the last bit again. Uh, other countries are dumping subsidized goods, often made in more polluting factories with lower or non-existent labor standards. I'm still not hearing from it. The, the uh, so what, are we, what, what was the trade side? Um, oh yeah, boy, yeah. here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the, the, I was one of, you know, got, I'm old enough to be hung up in the NAFTA fight back in the day, right? And this idea that labor markets don't respond to price signals if you're an auto worker, as I was, and went to a plant closing, as I did, you know that you're in the same labor market as, as Mexican auto workers, right? They're stuck in a repressive system. Now, what Nancy Pelosi did, what the Biden administration has done, we'll hear from Ambassador Ty later, to fix that and start talking about a worker-oriented trade, 
But again, this goes back to the, to the finance folks running the system, right? And uh, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, Suzanne Berger from MIT wrote a very nice article saying how finance gutted manufacturing, right? And so this whole idea that, well, this is Mexico, we heard so much, oh, it's about market access. No, it wasn't. Oh, the, you know, the low skill stuff will be done and the maquilas and the other stuff will stay here. No, it didn't. So this whole, the, the, there's the, you know, the whole Peterson Institute uh, uh, scam, uh, if you will. There's just, we've never really properly described in public policy terms what was happening with trade until about the last five years. I feel like that's a good place to end it. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Maggie, Brad, Todd, thank you.